In I Love You With My Ford, a woman's dreaming face rises from a sea of orange spaghetti, a pollock in pasta, to kiss the grill of a Detroit car. Generally, there's no politics in Rosenquist's fantasies of desire, but in 1965, he produced an exception to that, an enormous panorama about Vietnam called the F-111, the name of a strategic bomber. It was panels covered with aluminum. Over the surface of that, I used Italian wallpaper rollers to give an idea of nuclear fallout and so forth. And there was a runner's hurdle, so one would hurtling oneself into a blind spot. And then a angel food cake that was a metaphor for a missile silo. Above that is a Firestone snow tire that had this tough looking design of industry. And I thought of this plane going through all this flack of household items, light bulbs, nuclear imagery, things during peacetime. There was a little girl, blonde hair under a hairdryer, as the pilot of this bomber, like an aviatrix. and on to a rendering of a hydrogen bomb in a red grisaille with an umbrella over it with snow in the umbrella, like a view from a resort onto a nuclear bomb. Then a underwater swimmer with a gulp of air going to the surface, which was like the air missing in Dresden during the bombing. Then a field of Franco-American spaghetti. The F-111 summed up Rosenquist's vision of America as an Eden compromised by its own violence. The 60s were also a time of the face and the flashbulb, the great American fixation on celebrity, disposable renown that gripped the culture as never before. It would get its artist laureate in Andy Warhol, who fastened his own identity to the identicality of American glut. Andy Warhol did most of his best work over a span of six years, finishing in 1968 when he was shot. And most of it was connected to one central insight, which was that in a culture of raw data, where most people experience most things through a scrim of media stereotypes, the affectless artist has a place. You didn't need to be hot and earnest anymore. You could be super cool, like a slightly frosted mirror. Andy Warhol didn't sit down and work that out. He knew it in his bones. He understood it instinctively. He was a conduit for a kind of collective American state of mind whose idea of sacredness is celebrity and his themes of death and fame. On the one hand, you had the icons of publicity, the film stars, Liz, Marilyn, Elvis, the face of Jackie Kennedy, 
who double and quadruple and multiply like images of the saints at the hands of a Polish Catholic boy who was utterly fascinated by their aura and remoteness and pervasiveness. The production of fame was an American industry and everything to do with it mesmerized him. Oh, this is so glamorous. <sighs> you don't have to do anything. Just what you're doing. Knowing that America makes all its children want to be famous, no matter how dull they may actually be, he produced endless hours of unwatchable film about the doings of his circle of friends and hangers-on in his studio known as The Factory. Later, he expanded this into a silkscreen portrait service for genuine and wannabe celebrities, a cosmetic operation that stripped the idea of social portraiture down to its bare chassis. His silence, his deadpan lack of affect, became a Rorschach blot onto which a hot culture could project its curiosity about artists. Here he is with his dealer, Ivan Karp, and an interviewer who was getting nowhere. Well, this is something that people wouldn't see every day, then something that is so familiar it's become invisible to them. So why did you decide to paint the electric chair? Uh, I don't know. But he did know, of course, and so does anyone who sees these bare, mute, grainy images. The dark side of Warhol was the most interesting one, maybe the only interesting one. He was truly mesmerized by death, American death, whether inflicted by the state or simply by random accident. Over and over again, he silkscreened photos of it. A suicide's body crashed on the roof of a car in baroque swirls of black and white. A car burning in suburbia with its driver hanging from a telegraph pole. Goya he wasn't, not by a million miles, but in these paintings he was true to his experience and to his voyeuristic nature, and that gave them a grip that his more frivolous and routine stuff, now that he too is dead, no longer has. And that is true of his gold Marilyn as well. Suicide, drag queen, Madonna, all rolled into one. Not only was Marilyn Monroe dead when Warhol painted it, but the whole world she stood for was dead. That kind of peroxide, sex bomb, movie glamour has more to do with the gleaming chrome on a 1957 Cadillac than it does with the Volkswagen of 1959 or the squared off Lincoln Continental that Kennedy was shot in, which is a black box in 1963. It's a past style, and it therefore has the kind of stink of death on it, and that there is not just the fact that Marilyn is dead, but also the sense that a lot of the consumer culture they represented had the, the sense of something passing on it. There was something elegiac about what they did with consumer culture. The end of the 60s looks like archaeology today, and who believes any more in the binding power of national fetishes of prestige like the space program? Not even the amazing feat of putting Americans on the moon could altogether convince other Americans that all was well on Earth. John Kennedy, Martin Luther King, Bobby Kennedy, all dead, assassinated. The war in Vietnam stalled and perhaps unwinnable. Huge splits of race and gender, class and belief were opening in the American polity, and the clamp of the Cold War could no longer hold them together. Perhaps it never had been as easy to be an American as many Americans thought.
Visit American Visions at PBS Online and further explore the American experience through art at the address on your screen.